Well, how many love Jesus? Yeah. Me too. Praise God. Well, we're in for a treat today, and thank you for hosting us. This is our first time to your church and also to this part of California. We've been all over the state, but never, never to Temecula. So this is a, a treat for us in so many different ways. And uh, I just want you to know that we pray and believe that God's power works in this church, yeah. in this valley, yeah. in this part of the state, and across the country and around the world in the name of Jesus. Right. You have to have a world vision yeah. because God does. Yeah. And if he does, then we need to in the name of Jesus. Yeah. So how many brought their Bibles today or their Bible app or their, their tablets or their devices, whatever you're choosing to use? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the power and presence of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, that we approach your word this morning with reverence and respect. We thank you, Lord, for all of those out there watching online. Same for them. We thank you for the power and presence of the Lord wherever they may be. We thank you that as we approach your word today, we do so with reverence and respect. And we thank you, Lord God, that your word will not return to you void. And we thank you that you will make good on your promise to confirm the word with signs and wonders following. So we thank you for that. And we expect that today in the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord, to be salt and light in this world in a very dark and dreary place. We thank you, Lord, for being the light of the world and the, the hope that only the Christian can provide. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody that agrees with that said together, amen, 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 amen. amen. Well, again, uh, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to come and share the word with you today. Um, just to give you a bit of background, because you don't know us much, except your pastors may, but you don't know who we are and where we work for the Lord. 42 years ago, the Lord sent me to the Philippines with $20 in my pocket on a one-way ticket and no way back. I was a graduate of Rhema Bible Training Center, while I was there, the Lord spoke to me in divine ways, which would take too long to, dis to discuss today, but uh, put me on a plane in LAX with 20 bucks and no way back to America, flew across the, the world with $20 and landed with no one there to meet me, did not know if anybody knew I was coming. I wrote letters to people, but they never answered me, <laughs> which still happens a lot, but <laughs> praise the Lord. The point is, I flew blind. I prayed in tongues for 12 hours on that flight from LAX to Manila and then got off the jet. There was uh, two, Uzi, two uh, Marines, Philippine Marines with Uzi submachine guns going through the baggage, the carry-on baggage of the passengers because I flew into a country under martial law. At that time, Marcos was in power. There were guns and tanks and soldiers on every street corner. And I flew into this and uh, started the ministry in September of 1980. From then until now, we have built a ministry organization that numbers between 275 and 300 churches. Wow. And we have had the distinct honor of representing Jesus in crusade ministry, which is always the bedrock of what we do, crusade work, outreach. We've led over 750,000 people to Jesus in 42 years. So give God the glory. Give him the glory. Amen. And along the way, he brought my lovely wife, Ethel. Amen. You know, I was not intending to get married. I left as a single man. I thought, you know, I'm going to be the next Apostle Paul. I'm going to go out there and win souls. I used to roam around Rhema declaring in the name of Jesus, I'm going to build churches. I'm going to cast out devils. I'm going to build the kingdom of God. That's what I'm talking about. And then I landed, and about two weeks after I landed in the Philippines, I, went, I was sent to the church where she was there as a member of the youth. And I took one look at Ethel, and I thought, now that's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Yay, verily. Oh, Shandai, Shandai, see my bow tie. Praise the Lord. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. He that finds a good looking wife finds something better. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Well, glory. Uh, okay, Mark chapter 16. Let's go there. Let's talk about God and his word today. This message just was dropped into my heart about a month ago. Just supernaturally, I was in bed preparing for service on Easter Sunday morning last month, or maybe two months ago now, and uh, I was just laying there thinking about the sermon that I had put together, and the Lord just dropped this in my heart. I got out of bed, went into the office, sat in front of my computer, and, and this thing just came up out of my heart within 15 minutes. And so I want to share it with you today because it's very much in line with your summer theme of saltiness. Okay, very much in line with this. 
I'm going to talk to you this morning about the seven most important words in human history. That was the title he gave to me. The seven most important words in human history. I wrote that down. And he led me to Mark chapter 16. Let's begin with the first verse. We'll read, and I'm always reading from the New King James Version, unless otherwise indicated. Okay? Mark 16, verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was, was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought, bought spices and they, that they might come and anoint him. Verse number 2. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where the sun, when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now let's pay attention to the next two verses, verses 6 and 7. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. In those two verses, there are seven words. And he called these the seven most important words in human history. And we'll talk about what they are and why they are. And this was done on Easter Sunday morning. So I'm thinking resurrection. I'm thinking, you know, talking about the resurrection of Jesus and what that means to us and what that did to the devil, etc. But this goes far beyond just the Resurrection Day celebration. This is life right here, these seven words. This is how you function. This is how you find your purpose. This is where you, you're no longer a brother blend in. You are a boat rocker and a wave maker and a shaker and a mover for Jesus. You get right up in people's faces and you tell them the truth straight up. Amen. Well, they might not like me. I guarantee many people won't like you. They'll hate your guts for it. But I've always said if you can't find at least a half dozen people off the cuff that hate your guts because you're Christian, something's wrong with your testimony. Probably you don't have one yet. Okay? All right. Here they go. Here we go. Now this is the angel talking to the women. The women came to anoint the body because, because of the crucifixion and the way it all came down. They did not have a chance to anoint the body for burial according to Jewish customs. So they're going to come and do that. That's why they brought the spices and all of this. Well, the angel's there. And he's talking and he says, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. Here's the first three words. He is risen. That is what we are here for. We are here to let the world know he is risen. We are not serving a dead idol someplace. All other religions follow dead people, dead concepts, dead theories. We don't do that. We serve a living, breathing Jesus who the Bible says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not dead. He's very much alive. And he's living inside of everybody who accepts him as Lord and Savior of their lives. And he's coming back very soon. In the name of Jesus, I'm looking forward to it. How about you? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But there are things we need to do before he shows up. Okay? Whether you're, you know, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it really doesn't matter. Just be ready to go. Whenever he shows up, just be ready to go. Okay? He is risen. Jesus is alive. And that's the reason we can choose life instead of death. That's the reason why our free will is the only thing standing between us and eternal life is our choice to accept Jesus Christ. Our sins have been paid for. Every sin we could ever think to commit or commit has been wiped out and washed away by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Amen. He did this for us. He didn't need to do it for himself. He did it because of us. Okay. He paid for our sins. Eternal life is now available. And listen to this. Nothing stands between you and salvation except you. Now see, in the Old Testament, sin stood in the way. There was us. There was God, and sin stood in the middle, and that was the barrier. God cannot fellowship with sin, and we could not redeem ourselves. So we were stuck. So that's why Jesus came, Philippians chapter 2 talks about it, left heaven, came to earth, took upon himself the form of a bondservant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion and appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 
And if you've ever, if you've ever studied crucifixion, that is a horrible way to die. Yes. Horrible. It's one of the most painful ways a man can be put to death. And Jesus, our creator, allowed himself to be laughed at, spit upon, had his beard torn out from his face, the, the crown of thorns rammed down on his head, his back was whipped wide open, the Bible says, by his stripes. Yeah. Let me tell you, in the Hebrew, it's not stripes, it's stripe, singular. His back was so whipped wide open, it was just one big, big, massive wound from one side to the other. There were no stripes, it was just one big stripe. They ripped his flesh right off his back. And then he had to carry the cross up the hill and have nails driven through his hands and feet. You can imagine the pain. You know, history tells us that people crucified like that would be screaming. You could hear it for miles. Yeah. Jesus never opened his mouth. Yeah. Never opened his mouth. He knew what he was there to do. And he recalled from it in the garden. He said, if there's any other way, show me, Father God, you know, I don't want to do this. You know, in his humanity, he recalled from this. But he knew, you know, never, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Because I love these people. Because God so loved us, yeah. he sent Jesus. Yeah. And the good news is he died, paid for our sins, and three days later rose from the dead. Yeah. Yeah. Glory to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Eternal life is now available. Nothing stands between us and God except our choice to receive him as Lord and Savior. You may be watching out there wherever you may be, sitting at your kitchen table or on your sofa or in bedroom, wherever you may be, it doesn't matter. Jesus still loves you and he cares for you and he died for you. He rose from the dead. And if you use your free will to accept him as Lord and Savior, he'll do the same thing for you that it couldn't do anybody in this room here. We can receive eternal life, not by our works, but by our faith in what he did for us. That's the message we share. It's not denominations. It's not Calvinism, Armenianism, and all the other isms. This is just the simple message he is risen yes. from the yes. dead. Yes. Look with me at uh, John 14, 6. Let's look at a verse to support these things. John 14 and 6. Thank you, Jesus. Familiar verse. I'm sure you'll recognize this one right off. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, talking to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. Jesus is the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's it. Witnessing should be pretty simple. You tell people straight up, Jesus Christ is the only way. You want to go to heaven? You accept him. You want to go to hell? Reject him. Take your pick. There is a heaven, there's a hell. And people, when they die, their body's buried, but they're not buried. They go home. And if they're if they love Jesus and have accepted him, they go up, home is up. If they haven't, home is down. And whichever way you go, once they bury your body, you go forever. There are no parole board hearings in hell. You're gone forever. Try to wrap your mind around forever. You know, being with Jesus, that's a marvelous thought, to be in the presence of the Lord forever. But flip that coin over, to be lost in a lake of fire forever? That's what we're dealing with here. That's why I don't play church games with people. You know, we're not here just to influence friends and influence people. We're not graduates of Dale Carnegie's course. We are here to tell people straight up, there is a heaven, there is a hell, and you're going, Jack, to one or the other. Everybody goes to one or the other. Now, I'm telling you straight up, Jesus is the way. Someone says, well, you Christians, you're always so narrow-minded. Are you... Yeah, are you supposed to lead us to believe that good, sincere seekers of truth like Muslims and Buddhists and others out there, you know, are all on their way to... Yes, they are all on their way to hell if they do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. Because Muhammad didn't pay for our sins, Jesus did. Buddha didn't pay for our sins, Jesus did. He is the only one who could pay because he was born of a virgin. His blood was pure. Not Muhammad's, not Buddha's, not the Pope, not anybody. Jesus. He is the only one qualified to be our sin substitute. He sits at the right hand of God. Nobody else is qualified to sit there. It's his blood on a mercy seat. Nobody else's blood's on a mercy seat because nobody else's blood was pure to be put on a mercy seat. Well, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, go to hell. Can I tell you? <laughs> Hallelujah, yeah. Praise Jesus. Okay. He is risen. He is risen. Praise the Lord. 
You may have discerned rather quickly that my counseling sessions are rather brief. <laughs> There's no point circling the wagons for 45 minutes. I'll give you the verses that cover your situation, and I'll tell you, be warm, be filled, and be gone in Jesus' name. <laughs> See me in six months. Praise the Lord. All right. So the first three words out of those seven words, he is risen. Here's the next two. Getting back to Mark's gospel. Let's go back to the reference there, the the beginning text, Mark 16, verse 6, He is risen, words 1, 2, and 3. Then moving into verse 7, he tells the ladies, but go tell his disciples. Okay, the next two words, go tell. See, that's what we're supposed to be doing down here, going into all the world and telling people that he is risen. Tell them the good news. If they don't know, the Bible says, how will they know except the preacher be sent? Okay, you have a preacher that has been sent here from another continent, from another part of the world. Yeah. Amen, and we go to the Philippines from this part of the world. God sends us all over the place. Yeah. He puts us, the Bible says, where he wants us to be. It's like a big chessboard. Yeah. Okay, well, praise God for wherever we go, the message remains the same. Yeah. You can change methods, you can change songs, you can change the lights, yeah. but you don't change the truth. Yeah. The truth is the truth and that's it. Just proclaim it. Go tell people. If they accept, good for them. If they don't, that's their funeral, not yours. You have discharged your responsibilities. I learned a long time ago, I don't argue with people. There's no point. Truth does not need to be defended. It just needs to be proclaimed. Because it's the truth no matter what you do with it. It's going to be the truth. You can tell people, I don't believe in gravity, but if you climb up to the top of this building and jump off, you'll find there's gravity. You can say, I don't believe it all day long, but it's there. So don't, don't waste your time debating yeah. with people. Yeah. Jesus walked away. Yeah. He didn't waste his time with these people. Amen. Amen. He just told them the truth and then left. Let them argue about it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> There's nothing to argue about. It's the truth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. People will love you. People will hate you. So what? What difference does it make? At the end of the day, I want to hear God say to me, well done, yeah. good and faithful, sir. I'm not going to stand before your judgment seat and you're not going to stand before mine. Yeah. Someone say Amen. We need to get rid of all of the politics, all of the lies, all of the distractions out there where the devil seeks to get us into all these little camps. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. There is no racism in heaven and there is no racism in hell. God loves everybody equally across the board. It doesn't matter who, where, or how educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter to God. The skin color, the neighborhood they grew up in, their national, he doesn't care. He loves everybody. And on the other side of that coin, the devil hates everybody. So we should love everybody. Our churches should be multicultural. Everybody should be welcome because God loves everybody. That's it. That's it. We're not judging anybody. We're just telling people the truth. Jesus loves you just where you are. He loves you. He loves you wherever you are right now. Amen. You, may, you might be at McDonald's watching this on your phone. He loves you anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. All right, go tell. Our job now is to share this message that he has risen with the world without apology or compromise. I'm sorry, I don't compromise the truth. You may hate me for it, but I'm not changing my message. I'm not just, this is not some user-friendly deal here. Amen? No, 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 no. We're going to be like Jesus. Amen. Just follow him and let the chips fall where they may. Look with me, if you would, at um, Acts chapter 4. There's too many verses. We don't have time for all of this. But I'll just pick and choose a few from my notes. Acts chapter 4, verse number 7. And by the way, I understand that when I say there are seven most important words in human history, I understand there's other languages. I understand there's other translations. I'm just telling you that based upon the English language we're using yeah. and the New King James that I'm using, there are seven words. Now, you know, in Filipino, there are more than seven. There are probably more in Russian. There's probably more words in French or whatever. I got that point. But the understanding is that in our language, in our vernacular, in our situation right now with this translation, seven words cover everything. Yeah. You understand that part? So I got that, okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, verse number seven. Acts 4, 7. When they had set them in the midst, this is Peter and John, they're being interrogated for the miracle in Acts 3. 
they said, by what power or by what name have you done this? This would be the miracle that they recorded in Acts chapter 3. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And here it is. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Period. End of discussion. Now look at verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived, listen to this, that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They were shocked that these blue-collar factory assembly line workers could preach and declare with such boldness that the, and, and the miracle, the man was standing right next to them. Yeah. The miracle. Yeah. They couldn't believe it. They weren't graduates of Rama or, or Roberts or the Jerusalem Institute of Theology or Galilee Bible Tech or whatever the case may be. They weren't graduates of any school. They were just fishermen and tax collectors. And look what God did with these people. Yeah. When they saw the boldness of these people and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled, and here it is, they realized that they had been with Jesus. When people see you, do they realize that you have been with Jesus? Do you look like, sound like, act like, talk like, dress like, walk like Jesus? Think about it. I mean, that's who we are. Does not the Bible call us ambassadors for Christ? What's an ambassador? An official representative of the country who sent them yeah. to another country somewhere else. Okay? That's what we are. We are sent from heaven to represent the interests of heaven to the world, to tell the world Jesus is risen, to tell the world everything they need to know to turn their life around and reverse course. Instead of going to hell forever, they can go to heaven forever because we tell them there's only one way and his name is Jesus. The good news is your sins are all paid for except for the one. See, Jesus died for every sin that you could ever commit except for the one. God left this up to every person. It's called the choice to accept or reject Jesus. He didn't pay for that one. That's up to you and that's up to me. That's on us. He took care of everything else. No matter what you've done out there, no matter what you've done in here, it's been paid for. It's covered and washed away. There's no condemnation for those who are living in Christ Jesus. Amen. So it doesn't matter, well, yet God never used me. That's a lie from the devil. We're going to get to that one in a minute. Okay, so they said they saw, they realized that these people had been with Jesus and seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Yes. Amen. They could say nothing against it. And go down to verse number, let's see, 21. When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done because the man that had been healed was over 40 years old, the Bible says. Amen. And they went back to their own company. You can read the rest of the verses. They prayed for boldness. They weren't going to hide. They're not going to hide behind their Bible. They're just going to go out there and do what they're told to do and let the miracles speak for themselves. Amen. I preach the way I preach because we see what we do, what we do and we see what God does what, with what we say and what, with what we do. Okay, point is, I don't, I, this is not theory here. We've been overseas, we've seen blind people healed. We've seen deaf people healed. We've seen cripples walking off and just leaving and not even saying thank you. You know, just like, well, so what? You know, go ahead, be you. But the point is, you know, we've seen the dead raised. Yeah, have. There was the one crusade we did. There, it was a big crowd, you know, and a, a man had brought his dying infant to the hospital, not to the crusade, but the hospital two blocks away from where the crusade was being conducted. He didn't know there was a crusade going on, and the baby died in the hospital. And the, the people are trying to console the father, and, and they said, there's nothing more we can do. But there's a crusade going on down the street. It's been going on for a few days. We're hearing things. People are being healed and stuff. Take your baby down there. Maybe they can do something for you. Wow. He grabs the infant runs to the crusade. By that time, my wife and I are done with the salvation portion of the message. We're now praying for the sick. There was about 400 people there. 
and it's in the park, you know, the sun's beating down on people, it's sweat, dust, and it's, it's just what, what it is, you know. And he's in the back, he can't get to the front because of the press, you know, the people surging forward for prayer. My wife and I are on a platform, we're praying for people, moving them to the side. He can't get to the front, there's no aisle, there's no hush, there's nothing. He's screaming in the back, my baby, my baby. We're looking in the back, we, can't, we can see him, but we can't really pick up what he's saying. He says, my baby, my baby. And he can't get to the front, so out of desperation, he hands the dead infant to people, and they're passing the infant overhead, coming forward. We see this baby coming forward. And he's in the back, you know, screaming, my baby, dead baby, blah, 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 like that. And we take the baby, we scoop the child up in our arms, you know. My wife was standing right next to me. The kid's dead, blue lips, you know, the whole nine yards. And we just spoke. In the name of Jesus, we command the death to leave. The lips turn pink, rosy red, eyes popped open. He started crying. Healed. Brought back from the dead. Well, give God the glory. It wasn't me. <laughs> wasn't me. Well, praise the Lord. What'd you do after that? Well, we passed them back. All the way to the back. Amen. See you later. Praise the Lord. Let me tell you, you know, one miracle is worth 10,000 sermons. You can't debate the miracles. That's why I don't, I don't apologize for this. I know where I've been and I know what I've seen. Amen. And if you're here today and you need a miracle, I'll tell you, by the power of God, it's present in the room right now to heal people. Wherever this gospel goes, so goes the power to confirm it. So if you're here and you're struggling physically, never mind your past history, never mind what the pharmaceutical people have to say, never mind what the doctor tells you. Listen, doctors are practicing medicine. And they're practicing on you. Sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. Oh, well, oops. You know, listen, you can take your drugs all you want to, but, you know, it's a little bit of a red flag when you got a 60-second commercial about the latest drug that they're pushing, and 35 seconds out of the 60 are all the side effects that could happen if you take, if you take Shazamazan, you know, for your excess earwax or whatever it is, you know. you know. Consult your physician immediately if you happen to notice you're growing horns on the top of your head. Side effect there. Or a tail, whatever. Okay. So, he is risen, words one, two, and three. Go tell, yeah. four and five, and now the last two, six and seven. It says in Mark's gospel there, again, going back to Mark. Let's reread our, our text, Mark 16, verse seven. Verse seven, go tell, go tell his people, go his, tell his disciples, and Peter. The last two words, and Peter. Why is that so important? Because we are all works in progress. And he's using us to spread the gospel. I find that amazing. That he, so perfect, and with such, with, with what's on the line, eternity in heaven or hell, that's what's at stake here. He chooses to limit himself to partnership with us to share the gospel. He doesn't skywrite the gospel. That's coming later on in the tribulation. Angels will be flying through the sky preaching. But not in this dispensation. This is the dispensation of grace. That means he's depending upon his ambassadors, which is you and me. That's Mark chapter 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that does not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them who believe. And the signs shall follow us. Okay, that's going and telling. And the signs to confirm. But see, along the way, we make mistakes. They're called sins. They're called broken vows, promises made and not kept. It's called disobedience. It's called God telling us to do things and we doing something else. It's called the sin that so easily besets us in Hebrews. The good news is you're never at a place where God is finished with you. Ever. Ever, you're sitting there thinking he'll never use me again. That's a lie from Satan. He wants to use you again. He's just waiting for you to recognize and acknowledge the sin. Get it covered under the blood of Jesus. Get it washed away and we're back in business for God. Yes, come on. Philippians chapter 3, Paul. If that man had skeletons in his closet. He killed people. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, he says, there's one thing I do and the one thing has three parts. Forgetting the things which are behind Pressing forward to the things ahead, reaching forward to the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. The first of the three things, forget what's behind us. Yeah. Yeah. I've made mistakes. 
So have you. We all have. The more you press in, the more you're going to be shot at by the devil. You'll get hit, you'll be wounded, and you'll bleed. I told my pastors overseas, if you're looking for some kind of cakewalk, you're in the wrong area. If you, if you want to you know, you go with me, don't, don't expect to be tiptoeing through the tulips. I'm going to tell you, you're going to get shot at, you're going to get wounded, you're going to bleed, you'll be maligned, lied to, spit on, back bitten, and everything else down the, down the tubes. But God will never leave you, he'll never forsake you, and you need to never forsake yourself. If anybody needed to hear this, it was Peter. Because that was the guy that sat at the table in front of everybody and said, I'll never deny you. If everybody else denies you, not me, Lord. And the Lord said, oh, yeah, really? I got news for you. Before the rooster crows twice tonight, you'll have denied me three times. And after the rooster crowed that second time and Jesus turned after he just denied him the third time, Jesus looked right at him. He was, a, he was a, within earshot. You could hear it. You can imagine how low Peter felt. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. Have you ever wept bitterly? You knew you messed up bad. I've been there. Oh yeah, I've been there, sure. But no matter how many times you failed God or messed up, God will never abandon you. There is always hope and forgiveness. God, you can always be used. You will never be discarded. Don't buy into that. The devil will sit on your shoulder and say, because of what you said or because of what you did, you'll never be used again. That's a lie from Satan. Don't buy into those things. Are you listening? Get cleansed. Get it under the blood. Get it washed away and get up and get moving. Move forward in the name of Jesus. Amen. I tell my pastors, don't sit there feeling sorry for yourself. You're not going to hear it from me. Get your helmet, get up, get off the canvas, quit feeling sorry for yourself, pick up your weapons, put the helmet back on and re-engage the enemy. We'll bleed with you, we'll stand with you, but we're not going to forsake you. Look with me at, my God, so many verses here. Um, let's see, uh, let's go to Micah, Old Testament. My friend Micah. Thank you, Jesus. God wants to use you no matter what is going on in your life right now. And here, by the way, this is a revelation. Write this one down. When, God, when you confess your sins to God is not when God finds out about them. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a thought, okay? He already knows what's going on. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're looking at on your computer screen. He knows who your friends are. He knows what you're taking for, you know, pills or whatever. He knows the whole nine yards. So, you know, you might as well just come clean with God because he already knows. Be honest with him. Okay? All right, Micah chapter number 7, verse number 8. I love this passage from the Old Testament. Micah chapter 7, and verse number 8. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. Not if I fall. When I fall, I will arise. I'm going to get up off the canvas. When I sit in darkness, that's because of the sin, I'm sitting in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Verse 9, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until, everyone say until. until. All right, until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. See, that's Jesus at the right hand of God. He's the intercessor. He's the advocate. He's the lawyer that's pleading your case. And every time we commit the sin, God says, all right, they, they transgressed, but Jesus steps in. He pleads their case before the judge and says, yeah, but I paid for that. Look over at the mercy seat. It's not a judgment seat. It's a mercy seat. Yeah. The father looks over, sees the pure blood on that mercy seat and says, that's right. Based upon your sacrifice for their sins, they are forgiven. Case dismissed. Every single time. Every, you'll never find God saying, you know what, you've done this enough. Yeah. I'm tired of this, you've screwed up so many times, I, I need a calculator to, to, to add it all up, and I'm done with you. You're never going to hear God say that. He has invested the life and blood of his son in your redemption. He believes in you. He loves you. Amen. And if you go to a church like this, you're going to hear that here. Amen. Let, you know, let, let me tell you something. You know, we're not in competition with anybody out there, but I got news. You probably drove past a dozen churches to get to this one. And if, if I know anything about 44 years of serving Jesus and 42 years in ministry, most of these places are cemeteries in disguise. 
They got a name out there, you know, fancy sounding names, but there's nothing going on inside the church. If you go here or churches like this, you're going to get challenged, pushed, stretched, confronted, encouraged, slapped around a little bit, but hey, praise the Lord, it works. <laughs> yeah, every Christian needs a good slap a meter. <laughs> you know, just, you know, they have you know, the little list, you know, like that, depending upon what's going on. All right. All right, so God will execute justice for us. And my last passage, look at Romans 8. Romans 8, the icing on the cake, as they say. All right, you may be a Peter today, you may be feeling like a Peter today, but he went on to become one of the pillars of the church. Yeah, he messed up bad. You know, there's a, there's, there's a, very, there's a lot of similarities between Judas and Peter. They both betrayed Jesus. Okay, Judas hung himself. You can be sure the same demon that sat on the shoulder of Judas was sitting on the shoulder of Peter, telling him the very same thing. God's done with you, what you've done. There's no remorse, there's no forgiveness. You're done, you're finished. Judas bought into it, hung himself. Okay, and you can be sure the devil's trying the same tactics with Peter. Sure, trying, but look what Peter did. He got up off the canvas. So should you and for me. Why? Because of these verses. Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not... You know, you, we ought to read these things from time to time. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's us. It is God who justifies. It is who is he who condemns. It is Christ who died and furthermore is risen. There it is again, he's risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, COVID, or whatever else the devil has up his sleeve coming down the road? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Well, he's not done. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, powers or things present or things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. That's how he thinks about you. I mean, that's it. What a message. What a message to share with the world. Amen? You know, we, we, we go out there and talk about all kinds of things that don't amount to a spiritual hill of beans. Just talk about the stuff that matters. This. He loves you just where you are right now with life as it presently may be for you. He still loves you. He still does a job for you to carry out wherever you may be out there in, in uh, internet, internet land, wherever you may be. He's got a plan for you too. He knows you. He knows where you are right now. He knows what's going on in your life. Embrace the God of the impossible and let him do things for you that only he can do. Yeah. Quit trying to do it on your own. You're just going to be frustrated. Yeah. Okay? I've been around long enough overseas in countries where, you know, you can't cruise on another man's revelation in the Philippines. Oh, no, no, no. You'll, you'll go home. You, I've seen them shipped home in a box, dead. Good missionaries, good people that had good intentions. They couldn't make it. They couldn't cut it. There's no more CD of the month club over there. There's no more Christian bookstore in every street corner. In our, in our meetings, we have witch doctors that show up and communist rebels and Muslim fanatics. And, you know, we, this is what we've got. Okay, you, you got to know who you are in Christ. Okay, one time a, a Muslim, no, this was the witch doctor, the Muslim another time. The witch doctor, a lady, about 22, 23 years old, just came to the meeting. We had a three or 400 people in a, in a park outdoors, and she comes, and uh, we had praise and worship people singing, and they got done singing, so they sat down. The microphones were up here, so I'm getting ready to step up and preach. She runs up on the stage, grabs a microphone, and starts putting spells on people. In my meeting, how rude, how insensitive of you, you know, putting spells on people. And they knew who she was. They start to scatter. 
you know, and we were working with volunteers at that time. We have a team now, they would know what to do, but at the time, this was the early days, and this was the jungles, and nobody knew what to do. They were there to help, but they didn't know what to do. They turned to me with this clueless look on their face. And so I said, and the Lord said, do something about this now. This is not the time to go behind the coconut tree and pray in tongues for 45 minutes. You better know some things about who you are in Jesus now. Because she's putting spells on people. I said, okay. All right, I'll do something about that now. So she's got her, you know, I'm behind her, so I'm coming up from behind. She's got the microphone. She's speaking to people. I take the mic, yank it out of her hand, and toss it off to somebody. And I take her by the shoulders and spin her around so she's facing me. So then I'll just grab her by the front of her blouse, lifted her up, and threw her off the stage. <laughs> Someone said, well, that's not very spiritual. <laughs> You're right, it wasn't. But it was very effective. <laughs> yeah, baby. We never, saw, we never saw old honey buns again for the rest of the meeting. I can't imagine what happened to her. It's a tad bit of resistance here. <laughs> Wherever you go, the Holy Ghost is with you. The Holy Ghost is in you. Greater is he in you than the devil who is in the world. Amazingly, moments after we let her go, uh, we gave the altar call and gee whiz, everybody came to the front. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I want what that guy's got. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where do I sign up? Praise the Lord. So, Wherever you may be today, our best days are all ahead of us. COVID notwithstanding, listen, this stuff is going to continue coming down the road until Jesus comes in one shape, face, shape, fashion, or form. So get ready for this stuff. It's called the end times. It's called just before Jesus comes back. Okay, he's got verses in here to talk about all that stuff. Understand the day in which we live. Tumultuous, perilous times. Let's rise up and be everything. Let's be salty for the Lord knowing that he is risen and I'm going to go tell people and it doesn't matter what kind of mess I've made of my life Jesus will fix the mess only he can unscramble scrambled eggs in the name of Jesus and nobody else can and let's walk out of here clean and refreshed and ready to go Father in the name of Jesus we thank you for your word today we believe your word is sown in good ground and we thank you Lord that the people here today and those out there and in the internet, watching online, wherever they may be, via social media platforms, that they will take stock of the situation of their life right now, right now. And I pray, Lord God, that if anybody is here and you're not ready to meet Jesus, whether you're here in the building and you're not sure of your salvation, perhaps you're a good person, perhaps you're here as a visitor, a friend of a friend, I don't know. But God knows you. God knows your life. He loves you. He knows everything about you. Okay, and in the Philippines, when we do our crusades, this is what we tell people. Okay, we just tell them straight up. There's a heaven, there's a hell, and you're going to one or the other when you die. Okay, and listen, death comes to people many times at unexpected moments. They're not prepared for it. Right now, all around the world, there are people dying physically, and they're stepping out into eternity, and they are going up or they are going down. And whichever way they're going, they're going forever. They're going forever. So I want you to be sure today, wherever you may be out there watching online or in this building right now under the sound of my voice, I want you to be sure that if you were to die this afternoon, you would go straight to heaven and the next person you would see is the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? It's very simple. You reach out and you ask him into your heart and you make him the Lord of your life. We're not talking about being Catholic. We're not talking about being Protestant. We're not talking about being good people. We're not talking about selling Girl Scout cookies. We're talking about people accepting the fact that Jesus paid for our sins when we could not pay for them ourselves. He did what you can't do, what I can't do, what nobody can do. He died for you and paid for your sins. There's nothing standing between you and Jesus except you. So if you're here today with heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around, mind your own business, if you know you're not right with God, or if you know you're playing games, gospel games, you're here in church on Sunday morning, but you're acting like a devil from Monday until Saturday, if that's you, you're only fooling yourself because the devil knows what's going on and you're, you're, you're in dangerous territory here, okay? Don't let that continue. You don't know the day of your departure. Hell is full of people that thought they'd have one more chance and they'll never get it. 
They thought they'll do it some other time. Yeah, I know I need to be saved, but not today. Well, they never got another chance. You know, your one car crash, your one heart attack, your one stroke away from forever. You don't know. So be sure today, right now. So I'm going to count to three. When I reach three, you put your hand up. Put it up high so I can see it. Okay, and then we'll all stand together and we'll make a declaration of intent. It's not a prayer, it's a declaration. We are going to receive Jesus as Lord of our life and everybody will stand with you. You won't be embarrassed, I promise. Don't get nervous. Just be real with your life. Please understand it's your life. I can't save you. You can't save me. Jesus stands at the door to your heart and you have to open the door. Nobody else can do that for you. Not Pastor Henny, not Miranda. Nobody on this staff can help you except you. So here we go. It's a decision. It's not a feeling. We're not feeling our way to heaven. We're deciding, I'm changing course. I'm turning around. I'm accepting Jesus. That's what we're deciding to do. Feelings come and feelings go. But the decision is forever. All right? At the count of three. One, two, three. Hands up if I'm talking to you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen people that I count just off the cuff. Thank you so much for your honesty. Let's all stand. There may be more. It's okay. It's not the hand necessarily that does anything in particular, but it expresses the intent. And that's good. Even if you didn't raise your hand and you know you needed to, that's fine. Here's how we seal the deal. The Bible says, with our heart we believe, with our mouth we confess. Out there, you watching, with our heart we believe, with our mouth we confess. Heart, mouth, heart, mouth. Not just the heart. You got to say something. It's the words that seal the deal. So we're going to say something. I'm going to lead you. You're not talking to me. We're talking to Jesus. And he's listening. He's not too busy with what's going on in South America right now to listen to what you're doing because he died for you. He died for you. So let's say this out loud. Now listen. If people can scream at basketball games, if they can scream at football games and other things, how about let's raise our voice and let the devil hear us from five blocks down the road when we declare who we're serving for the rest of our lives. All right, so I'm going to lead. You follow. We're all talking to the Lord. Amen? Out there, wherever you may be, wherever you may be sitting in your chair or whatever, you say this out loud too, okay? Let's say this together. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. And I believe, and I believe that you are the Christ, are the, Christ the Son of God, Son of God that, you that you died on a cross, paid for my sins, for my sins and, rose from the dead. and rose from the dead. So today, so today I, make I make my choice. And for the rest of my life, of my life I, choose you, I choose you and you alone. And you, alone. You, are you are my Lord. And I am sorry, I am sorry for, all my sins, for all my sins. But right now, I receive my forgiveness, I my forgiveness. And, I am never back. and I am never looking back. Thank you, Lord, Thank you, Lord for saving me. For saving me. Amen. Amen. Now let's clap and give God the glory. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he's coming back. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father.